Welcome everyone. We are hugely fortunate to be invited by artist Melanie Mancho into her studio to find out more about the work that Art Fund has been helping museums to acquire and other works and a new one that Melanie is working on at the moment, Stephen, which Art Fund is supporting Liverpool Biennial to commission. So Melanie, thank you so much for having us here today. Thank you. And I think first of all, just let's start with this studio because it's the most fantastic space and it's on the top of your your house. Tell yes, us about uh, how that came about. Well, thanks for coming today, and you are the very first visitor. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> ever to come to see you because it's still, yeah, in the process of being finished. So we've been in this building for 21 years. It's a small industrial building in Hackney, and even when we first got here, we had this idea that you know we could build on top. It's a flat roof. It's smaller than all the other buildings. It's taken a fair long while to kind of get to the point of actually making it. We're reconfiguring part of the house to become a residency for young artists. It's something I feel very strongly about and I've been talking about for a very long time that young artists who now leave their MA and have studied in London want to stay in London quite often can't and there's this creative drain. There's no studio space, London is super yeah. expensive and I think we just found that rather than just bemoaning the fact that we're, that we're losing so much creative potential within London, in our tiny, tiny, tiny way we can do something about it. So we've reconfigured the entire house, reconfigured the studio so that we can have a studio residency for a young artist on a rotating basis. So that was the impetus for kind of creating a new space. I think that kind of moves us on to your practice, which is in film and photography and moving image and also performative work. So you don't have to splash paint around. In terms of the practice, it's all camera based. And the camera is almost like is the apparatus that pulls the, the world into the work. And it started off photographically, I studied photography and for the first probably 10 years of the work, it was very much dedicated to working photographically. And then it became more and more committed to making moving image work. And the work has particular kind of pillars that pull all the way through the last 20 years. And that has to do with performance to camera, expanded notions of portraiture, and participation and those things no matter whether I make a sound work, a video work, a film or a photographic project they're always there those sort of elements but the camera for me is important probably less because it's an image image making device more because it almost becomes an organizing principle that allows me to kind of orchestrate the relations that then come to become the work and all the work in terms of commitment to an expanded notion of portraiture deals with, addresses and questions our sense of place in the world. How, how do we kind of come to configure our sense of selfhood, subjectivity, these kind of complicated notions of identity. So let's have a look at the first work that we're going to ask you about, groups and locations. Tell us about this, because I can see the situational and relational straight off. So at the time in Moscow, I was interested in this kind of idea of group portraiture. This is 2004, a law came into, into practice that greatly curtailed people's right to congregate in public. And it was at the height of the Chechen war, and so you were no longer allowed to congregate with more than four people in a public space. Plus, photographing public space became increasingly difficult, partly a sort of left over from the Cold War, this great suspicion against photography, and what it can reveal. And that sort of like in my head kind of brought these sort of three strands together, this kind of history of group photography, the restrictions of congregating public and the restriction against photography. And then I made these groups and locations in Moscow in public spaces and I gathered people spontaneously. So all of these people that you see in one place together are just passers-by. They're not actually a group. They are all individuals who are passing by and I asked them fairly quickly whether they could stop stay where they are, we set up a, a big kind of plate camera and, and I explained that it's based on the history of Russian photography and that you know, we would take a group portrait of them. They all know they're not supposed to do this. They all know that this contravenes against the restrictions of congregation. Yeah. So it's like a mini protest. Yes, so that's quite a performance and a choreography it quite, in itself. Yeah, so it is quite performance yes. based. Yes. So it is almost like a street performance that brings together these people in this very momentary moment of protest. Yes. Um, and they then disperse and we try and send everybody the images afterwards. That's how my fascination with both the history and the kind of the, the in a sense, the currency 
of group portraiture started. And in a sense, groups and locations is so important to the practice because everything that's happened since comes, also from, here. comes from here. But I wanted to show you this as well because it links really well to some other work I wanted to show you. This is in the new Tretyakov Gallery. And so one of the only groups and locations photographs that's photographed inside and in an art space. What's really important to all of these photographs is that they are these highly authored spaces. So that's kind of, the, the, in a sense, the spaces are always the framework within which these kind of performances happen. And that comes back to what we talked about earlier on, that, you know, that we are locational. Locations define us. We, we move differently in different places. We articulate our bodies different in different spaces. Our gestures change depending on the space. That's why I kind of I try to kind of talk about it as this kind of relational and situational sense of being that is constantly constructed. We constantly produce ourselves. We produce ourselves for the next person that we talk to. We're different, slightly different versions of ourselves. Both in relation to people, but also in relation to spaces. So sometimes we feel confident and we can claim the space and other times we feel overawed by the space. Well, that takes us beautifully on to the next piece because yeah. it is all about, I think, people in space and a group portrait in a space that has an immediate sense of, are they overawed by it? Are they claiming it? Tell us about, this is a much more recent 2018 work. Much more recent, and it's interesting because it completely relates to groups and locations, and that's in fact how this body of work came about. I was invited by Andrew Nan from Kettle's Yard to consider making a new body of work for the reopening in 2018, and he was really keen to involve a group of residents that is in a sense the closest to where Cattle's Yard is located in North Cambridge, and there is a small but sizable Bengali community that is kind of not very well known within Cambridge. A lot of these women, even though they've been established in Cambridge for quite a long time, some of them have lived there for 12, 15 years, their kind of exactly their claim and their sort of sense of agency within Cambridge was fairly small. So we decided that the work would start by taking them on a number of walks to some iconic buildings within Cambridge. So we took them to King's College Dining Hall, to the Union Debating Chamber, to the Wren Library, to just kind of see how, how they felt about these kind of quite authored spaces and quite authoritarian spaces. I mean, Cambridge as a university, even though now, of course, it is fairly egalitarian, one has to remember that for a long time it was absolutely male. Absolutely. That's, you know, that's, it's fairly recent that women were admitted yes. to study there. That the, the women's colleges only started fairly recently and that knowledge production, hence, was kind of embedded within a sort of paternalistic and patriarchal structure. So to challenge that patriarchal structure by working with a group of women who had, in fact, most of them never been to the dining hall, never been to the Ren Library, never been to the debating chamber, and hadn't necessarily even walked around the centre and felt it was their place, kind of felt like an interesting kind of proposition. And the group of women calls themselves the ladies. So they refer to themselves as the ladies. We would meet and they would say, you know, oh, some of the ladies aren't here yet. So we went back to all these places, at which point they took over. And that's a really important part of the work. It became this very playful so sense of performing the space where they really had control over their own image. It's so important to remember the moment there's a camera, we produce ourselves for the camera. If we move on to this one, this feels to me as if the ladies have really taken ownership and they have designed themselves to reference, uh, for me, a number of different things, but also to say this, is, this, this space is something that is ours as well as anyone else's. It's interesting that you pick up on it because that's the last image we took. So they're probably the most comfortable by that point. They love the Wren Library. I mean, it's such a beautiful space. Yes. And to be in it and to, you know, to be allowed to kind of have that space to ourselves and to kind of position ourselves and to move around, to kind of look at some of these old books, was just very special. So there's a real sense also of entitlement and, and knowing that at this moment it's theirs. So let's move on to your video work because you've got a couple of pieces to yeah, show us. Yeah, great. The first one happened in Paris and then the second one happened in 2017 in London. Dance All Night Paris, Dance All Night London and you at Art Fund generously supported Dance All Night London. With all of these dance works is that they bring together people from vastly different cultures of dancing in a public space to dance together and to bring their sort of particular kind of gestural 
activity into a common space. It's an activity that we all have done over the millennia. People have always danced. And dancing in public is a hugely important practice for rituals. There were the dance manias in the middle medieval times, quite amazing for the now, because dance manias always happened after pandemics. So in each case, I bring together about 10 different dance organizations, dance schools who teach dancing, but different kinds of dance. Capoeira, um, hip hop, flamenco, salsa, all these kind of different walls, ballroom, these different kinds of dancers. Each group comes with a number of students and they are asked to kind of come together in a public space and dance side by side. And there's initially no given choreography, so they need to negotiate space. So in, in Paris, it's in the backyard of a school and they are they're entering the space one after another and then they kind of need to negotiate how they kind of like physically articulate the space through their gestures. London was the biggest of the three dance events. And so we had dancers dancing through the East End. It was part of Art Night. It was the year when Art Night was curated by Fatosh Ustek, hosted by the Whitechapel. It was all around the East End. And all these dance companies danced from their home where their dance school is located through the streets, picking each other up. And these swelling streams of dancers grew and grew and grew until they then came together in a place called Exchange Square, which is behind Liverpool Street Station. What happened then from 10 o'clock onwards is that each of these dance companies gave dance lessons to members of the public. These 750 headsets were out all night till four in the morning. It was down to the people of London picking up their energy, picking up this desire to dance together and filling this huge, huge dance space. It was packed. It was just one of those kind of amazing moments where this kind of idea of collective joy of being together of exchanging physically even though you know you're kind of like you're in proximity with each other but you're physically exchanging through your gestures and through the patterns you make so let's move to a more recent piece that you made in germany and just looking at this the brutalist architecture the lone horse wandering through an empty city at night it's it, I think you made it in 2018. It's That's so right. prescient for today. It just feels like if you had said to me today that you would have been making this over the months of COVID, I would have completely uh, believed you. But actually, you made it a couple of years ago. It was made indeed in 2018 in a very small post-industrial city in Germany called Mal, made at the invitation of the museum that's based bang in the middle of the city, um, a sculpture and video museum called Glaskasten Mal. It came about through kind of an engagement with this kind of brutalist post-industrial architecture that is very dominant in the city and the kind of history that leads to that. So, you know, at some point it was one of the wealthiest towns in Germany because it's right bang in the middle of all the mines. And because it was so wealthy, it commissioned this incredible architecture. It also commissioned hundreds upon hundreds of public sculptures. And if you think about public sculpture generally, it normally celebrates a hero and quite often a male hero, quite often on a male horse. hero on a horse. <laughs> yes. And so these kind of equestrian sculptures are dotted all over our Western civilizations. The other thing that then came to that is that the town is the home of one of the most famous um, horse jumpers, not just in Germany, but internationally. He's like one of the most celebrated and um, accomplished horse jumpers. And he's got his farm there. He breeds Olympic horses there in this little town. So that's when the kind of dots joined up. And I sort of got in touch with him and suggested to him that we would take one of his Olympic horses and put it on its own into this brutalist architecture and let it explore. And he was surprisingly very amenable and interested and thought it was a grand idea and turned up very early in the morning at five. So it's filmed very, very early in the morning and um, late at night to make sure the squares are empty. The quality of the light and the emptiness and, of the streets. Yeah, so um, turned up with this um, Olympic horse who conveniently is called Cornered Star. And the moment I knew that that's the name, I thought, well, that's the that's title the of the title work. Of the and so it does really speak about this kind of sense, slightly post-apocalyptic sense of the city emptying out, the brutality of, of what we as humans have put into the environment. Um, that there's literally, and you see at various points, he does look for things to eat and he cannot find a single piece of grass. So I think this work kind of plays with all of those ideas 
in a place with this kind of here the human is emptied out but of course it's very present these structures wouldn't exist without the human yeah, it's yeah. it's a it's it's an absolute human space but the, the, the horse kind of points to the absence of the human. I'd love to move us on to your right. current piece that you're working on, Stephen, uh, for Liverpool Biennial, commission supported by Art Fund, and I think has a history in 12, a piece that you made a few years ago. Exactly, yeah. 12 was made in 2015, and is in a sense the precursor in a really important way to the current work that you're so generously supporting. So the work started seven years ago when I started working with a group of 12 addicts who were all in very recent recovery, two weeks recovery from long-term um, substance addiction, mainly alcohol and drugs. And I made the work across three different centres. It was made in Liverpool, Oxford and London. But Liverpool was the, the largest group and um, it was made over three years, started in 2013 with a series of workshops that I ran in recovery centres where these people were recovering. And one of them was a young man called Stephen. And we were doing all these workshops, writing workshops, acting workshops, putting people in control of this idea of image making. Stephen was 26 at the time, young guy, checkered history, upbringing, comes from a family of generations of addicts. So at the time, he was, he was kind of like, he's this very charismatic, but sort of passive aggressive young man. The moment the camera turned on, pew, this whole other person turned up. Then, six months later, he was enrolled in drama school, he was really loving it, he became really passionate. We made 12, and then fast forward to about three years ago, we always stayed in touch, and I'm in fact in touch with most of the people from 12. And I was talking to Steve about, you know, how's it going in drama school, and he's having a really good time. He'd been headhunted into a drama school in Manchester from Liverpool. But he said, but you know, I'm still a poor kid from Kirby and I need to make money. Like many addicts, he's completely committed to social work, so he's training as a mental health nurse. And he said, you know, it's been a, it's been a good journey, but maybe, you know, that comes an end to what I can really do. How am I ever gonna make it? If only once, once, I could act in a film and show the world what I've got, once. And then I can put it to rest and, you know, or maybe something happens. And I thought, hmm, maybe we should write that film. So that's how the whole thing started. I knew that I wanted the film to be a sort of hybrid between a documentary, it's based on his real life, because his real life is quite phenomenal and really important, and there's incredible stories, but also that there would be a fiction, that it would give him an opportunity to kind of go into a role, to kind of go and transform. And I did a bit of research and found the first film ever made in Liverpool, BFI archive gem called The Arrest of Goody made in 1901. And it's based on the arrest of Thomas Goody, who embezzled 170,000 pounds from the Bank of Liverpool. Well, 170,000 pounds then Huge. is 21 Huge. million now. Whoa. You think, what happened? So then you do a bit of digging and researching. Turns out he was an addict. He was a gambling addict. So that's when the whole thing went like, you know, ah, oh, now this is interesting. I'm working with a substance addict and I'm gonna ask him to play gambling addict. So he can use his experience of addiction to portray another form of addiction. So we're making a film that's based on Stephen's life, where he auditions to become Thomas Goody. And we've written this very beautiful script with a, with a Liverpool-based scriptwriter. We co-wrote a script that is the contemporary story of Thomas Goody embezzling money from the bank where he works to feed his gambling addictions. But at the same time, it's also so it's, it has this kind of whole social impact strategy around. I'm working with a group of 20 addicts who take on the very support roles in the film. And we talk a lot about these kind of relationships between different forms of addiction and transformation. Filmmaking is an amazing tool to help people with mental health issues. So working with 20 people who all suffer with addiction and mental health issues has been an amazing experience. So we started in December last year, and this group by now has become an incredible cast. So they, they've, again, they've really kind of grown together. They're, they're amazing characters, amazing stories. Like there's so much energy when we all get together, 
when we can all get together again to film. The energy in the room is phenomenal. I'm so uh, excited with how you describe the kind of lifting of the lid on your process and all the different elements of your concerns, but also thinking about the individuals that you're working with, the, the notion of co-authorship, but you have such a clear idea also of what you want to achieve, both in terms of the film, but also in terms of empowering those people. It's an absolutely fascinating project. I can't wait to see it. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Melanie, thank you so much for inviting us to your studio. Thank you. Thanks for taking your time and coming.